Good evening and welcome. Thank you so much everyone for coming this evening. We're excited to share some information with you tonight about the Gifted and Talented program at Hillsboro in particular, and also about gifted and talented individuals in general. So my name is Cindy Assini. This is Dr. Joan Rudiman. I will introduce her more formally in a, in a few moments after I provide a little bit of overview information. So the evening will go. I will provide a bit of an overview about Hillsboro, our mission, our gifted and talented policy as per the Board of Education. Then Dr. Rudiman will talk with you about gifted and talented individuals in general and provide some really helpful information, some anecdotes to help you understand a little bit about where the field of gifted and talented education is. And then I'll come back at the end to both go over our identification procedures and answer any questions that you have. We'll both actually be able to answer questions depending on what the nature of the question is. So, just to, to start out, to stress that all of the educators here, we have two, three REACH teachers here. I'm representing the district, and we all really deeply care about the children in the district. Our goal is to assess needs and provide programming that matches those needs, because we want all of our students in Hillsboro to go forward and be leaders and take our community to great places. And, and make a difference in the world. So that's our overall mission and something that we come back to when we're making decisions about policy and programming and procedures. So we do have a specific board policy about gifted and talented education and I've bolded some of the key pieces of that policy because like most policies, it's, it's a little bit on the wordy side. So the key things for you to know are that we are looking for students who have exceptional ability. And we tell that by comparing students to their peers. So for those of you that have second graders, when you get test results this spring, you'll get COGAT results in two ways. One, you'll see how your child compares nationally to other students in all different states who have taken the COGAT. Then you will also see that students have a local rank that will just compare students to other students in Hillsboro. And as you can imagine, with Hillsborough being a very high achieving district in a very high achieving state across the nation, oftentimes the local percentile rank is going to be a lower score than the national percentile rank. Just to give you an idea, you know, your child might be in the top 10% nationally and in the top 30% in Hillsborough. That could happen. So we compare students to their peers and look for ones that really need modification who need more than it would be reasonable to expect a classroom teacher to be able to provide on a regular basis. And that's why we have the REACH program. So as far as the difference, um, I have two graphics up here that unfortunately are blocking the text, so I do apologize about that. But one, what? Yes, we'll see them again, but um, to think about the bright child as Elisa Simpson, she was supposed to fly in there. Um, you know, someone who always does well in school is a teacher pleaser and learns quickly, but you know, at a repetition of maybe six to eight times, um, and we'll pay attention in class, we'll do everything the teacher asks, is interested in finding the right answer. On the other hand, Bart could be considered a gifted child, and you're thinking, but Bart gets in trouble all the time, and, and Bart's doing experiments in the basement. Well, that could be characteristics. You know, when we talk about characteristics of gifted children, and Dr. Runneman will highlight this when she speaks, there are some where every parent's like, sign me up for that. And then there are some where any kind of person would think, whoo, that's going to be a bit of a challenge. So. A gifted child will often be the question asker, and while they enjoy learning, will become focused on, on one topic that they really want to learn so much about um, with a high level of intensity. So this is some instructional implications. Like I had mentioned, gifted students will often intuitively know the right answer or only need to hear it once. They can learn at a, a very rapid pace. Uh, a bright child, you know, Dr. Schiff, the superintendent of schools, likes to refer to these children as the bright, shiny apples. 
the ones that every teacher would love to have 22 of in an elementary class. On the other hand, a gifted child, while very high ability, could also want to explore the world in different ways than maybe the classes. So gifted learners have a lot more creativity. They want to manipulate information and create and make inferences and ask questions. So I will post this whole presentation online so that it's accessible to you along with a video of tonight um, for both you and any of your um, acquaintances that weren't able to make it. Again, coming back to the board policy. So all children, we like to think, have some natural curiosity, but there are some that are really exceptional in, in that area of ability, creativity, and that curiosity or task commitment that makes them want to go and learn something, go and do something, or create something. So that's really what we're looking for when we're trying to identify for gifted and talented, and it's not an easy process. So our REACH program, and again, we'll, we'll talk about identification after you hear from Dr. Ruddeman in more detail, but just to give you an overview of the program, at the elementary level, there is a specialist in each building, which allows us to have enrichment support where REACH teachers can work with classroom teachers for either unexceptionally able child or a small group of exceptionally able children in a given class. Grades one and two involve um, the REACH teacher doing a special once every six day cycle for all students in the grade level. And at grades three and four, there is a pullout program where generally students see the REACH teacher twice a week for about two hours total, broken up into different time configurations based on communication with the classroom teacher. The students work on a lot of independent projects and oftentimes students end up confused because the program at the elementary level is called REACH in first grade and second grade and third grade and fourth grade. It's really two different programs. Right now the district is going through a strategic planning process and one of the ideas that's emerged is perhaps calling those different names just to clarify for students, this is not some kids in the class going to extra special time. This is, you know, because you could see how a, an eight-year-old might think that. This is students that are going to work on independent research projects and it's actually a lot of work. So, you know, that's one of the things we're thinking about just for clarity purposes. At the five to 12 level, currently students are identified in second grade and, and can stay in the program. However, I use the word program loosely because it's actually programming that we offer and it's different at different levels. So because there is no specialist at um, the middle school, and we only have one specialist for the entire intermediate school, in fifth grade there is a REACH Social Studies class taught by that one specialist who did go through a gifted certificate program with Rutgers University. That's at the fifth grade level. In sixth through eighth grade, students have a social studies class that is taught by a social studies teacher with the idea of incorporating opportunities for creative thinking and research while also meeting all the grade level social studies standards, which is a really challenging task. Um, so again, with the district going through strategic planning, we'll see whether that continues that way or does change um, depending on the results of the plan and the decisions of the Board of Education. So as far as in the high school, there are many choices extracurricularly and academically in terms of honors classes, clubs, and different activities. So there aren't necessarily reach or gifted and talented classes, and I do want to stress that none of the options available for your child in terms of advanced coursework, either at the intermediate, middle, or high school level, are dependent on reach placement. For each program the district offers, we have specific criteria for that program. So when placements are done for advanced math or advanced literacy or honors social studies in the high school, REACH is not a consideration whatsoever. Those programs are open to all students, and there's no correlation between being in REACH, which again is identify, identifying students with exceptional needs at the elementary level, with students who may just be high achieving but may not have some of the same exceptionalities when they get to Auten Road and above. There's also a internship program at the high school which provides students the opportunity to do community service. And as you'll hear from Dr. Ruddeman, that really ties in nicely to a lot of gifted and talented research in terms of what's good for students. So at this point, I want to introduce Dr. Ruddeman. And
I don't want to forget any of the great details of the things that she has done. So she did serve as the resource specialist for gifted and talented in West Windsor Plainsboro, combination of teaching and coordinating the program there. And in addition to that, she's been very active in the field of gifted education. So she's been an adjunct professor at Rutgers University. She's been an active member and leader in the New Jersey Association for Gifted Children. In 2005, she won the Educator of the Year from the New Jersey Association of Gifted Children. She's also been honored by New Jersey National History Day. as She's quite involved in the National History Day program. She earned her doctorate in curriculum and teaching from Teachers College in Columbia and has been a friend to Hillsborough Public Schools over the last few years that she's presented here and also when she did a program evaluation for us under the previous supervisor, I would say that was five years ago. So it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Ruddeman. How many of you um, are first time second grade parents? Oh good, okay. Because so I have been here, we were figuring it out about probably six years. I've been coming up for this and um, Happy to know that the, uh, the tone and the tenor in the district is a lot calmer than it, it was when I was, when I was first here. Um, I take a lot of my uh, philosophy about education and gifted education from this guy, Joe Renzulli, who is still at the University of Connecticut. Um, when he started in the field of gifted education, he was vilified by the field. This is going back probably now 45 years, and the understanding of gifted was IQ, intelligence quotient. It was all very quantitative, and Joe just didn't see gifted in such a confined way, um, as, as we will see. His concept is giftedness, not gifted, but, but gifted behavior. Above average ability, note it's above average ability, he doesn't talk about genius level. Creativity and task commitment, which all when they intersect is gifted behavior. Doesn't happen all the time in every area, um, but when those, when those three variables connect, we have gifted behaviors. This is when kids can go beyond what is asked of them, beyond what is just uh, required by school. Joe is also one who has, um, uses the term schoolhouse gifted. And when I started in the field of gifted ed, um, people t would, would say, oh, you teach the gifted kids. Oh, that's, that's so great, you know? Thinking straight A students, well-behaved, love school, love their teachers, want to please their teachers. I taught middle school, and I would say, no, actually think of Steve Jobs at, at 13. If you know anything about Steve Jobs' life, he was a difficult personality. Was he a genius? Oh, no doubt but a difficult personality. Or um, Bill Gates, who in fourth grade was sent to the library, it was like March, with a note saying, I have done everything I can do for Billy, just keep him busy. Two weeks later, the librarian sent him back to his fourth grade teacher with, he has completely reorganized the library, I have nothing left for him to do. Be careful, parents, what you wish for. Parents that, that, oh, I want my kid to be a genius, wouldn't that be wonderful? That's, it's really a mixed bag. Over my years, I have taught some extraordinary young men and women, many now who are into their careers, they're medical doctors and high technicians and all kinds of wonderful things. Um, in two cases in particular, well, actually three, um, young men, um, the mothers were career women. Um, in one case, the mom was a medical doctor. And they completely gave up their careers to raise their sons because these boys, they weren't difficult, but as we will see, high energy, high intellectual energy. And it took everything they had to keep their kids engaged and busy and happy. So. 
If you have a child who is schoolhouse gifted, you are so blessed because they will always like school, they will do well in school, they'll get into the college of their choice, they'll be happy in their careers. These are really wonderfully balanced, lovely people. Um, would we call them geniuses? Maybe not in the sense of when we're thinking in terms of like a Bill Gates or Steve Jobs. One of the things that I've discovered over the years with working with um, gifted kids is that they are intrinsically motivated. This may be, you know, go back to this idea of task commitment. That may be the most critical component in really recognizing gifted behavior. When kids are intrinsically motivated, they, it's like a, a, like a burning desire in them to do something beyond what they're required to do, um, beyond what it, the expectation is. These are the kids when the teacher says, you know, you have to make a poster. Can it be round? Can it be three-dimensional? You know, um, I would talk to students as, as they would come into my program, they would they were self-identify that they wanted to participate with things that I had to offer in the middle school. Um, and I'd say, did you, did you ever have a, a project that, that, you, that you just loved? Like, you had to create a poetry book. And the requirement was 10 poems. You had to illustrate them and have a cover. And you wrote 25 poems. And you illustrated them all. And you, and you bound the book. And on you know, Sunday morning, it, the project was done. And you continued to work on it until you know, through Sunday night. Have you ever done something like that? And I would, I would have a few kids that were like, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you already had the A. You knew on Sunday morning. I mean, you showed it to mom and dad. You know, oh, this is beautiful. And you, you knew it was an A. You knew it was the teacher was going to be wowed by it. Why would you continue to work on that? Just because it meant something to me. That's the meaning of intrinsic, literally within. It has nothing to do with grades. It has nothing to do with praise. It has nothing to do with pleasing parents or teachers. It has to be it's this driving force from within. And it comes from a depth of, of passion, interest, um, that strongly motivates kids. And we'll talk more about this. Those kind of kids are our creative producers. I believe, and Cindy and Hillsborough definitely follow this, that if you're talking about, oh, if you're talking about gifted education, um, there are three components. It needs to be rigorous pace because these are kids that just get it faster. It needs to have some element of choice um, because they do have their own motivations and their own interests. And it has to be purposeful. It has to have a meaningful purpose. And I can tell you that getting a grade, an A, is not necessarily meaningful for really gifted people. Bill Gates went to Harvard and lasted less than a year. He played bridge pretty much 24-7. It's a card game, kind of an intellectual card game. My mother was an avid bridge player, and it's, it's a great game. The, the game that he played in his own mind was, how many classes can I skip and still get an A in the class? So he essentially showed up for exams. And he was getting his really good grades. Now, why would he waste a Harvard education? There were things that were just not purposeful or meaningful to him. Steve Jobs lasted less than one semester in a real small little college that was out in California near him. But interestingly enough, he never left school. He continued to go and take classes just because he was interested. One course that he took was calligraphy, writing, which we all can be thankful for because that's why we have beautiful fonts on our computers. Because Steve Jobs went back years later to um, his engineering people and said, why does, it, why does the type have to be so dull? Why can't it be, you know? And we have Lucinda graphics, right? <laughs> so it has to be it's something that has to be meaningful. I just keep touching this thing the wrong way. Gifted education should require research skills, the ability to find information on your own and analyze it on your own. This is required, in my mind, for 
everyone in the world and our students. There should be critical thinking analysis, problem solving involved, and there needs to be communication skills, both communicating with your partner or your mentor, but also being able to communicate a prog product out to a community, right? Out for uh, some kind of showcase or some kind of um, um, audience, an authentic audience. This slide just summarizes um, the numbers of people that, I, that this research is based on. I just want you to know that this isn't just coming out of what I think should be, but from a, a wide range of, of people in the field. There are gifted characteristics, and let's start on what would be your left side. Unusual alertness in infancy, rapid and early reading, superior language ability, enjoyment of learning, superior analytic ability, keen observation, efficient high capacity memory, superior reasoning and problem solving, thinking through the abstract and the complex, and seeing the big picture, high concentration, long attention span, being inquisitive, asking questions, searching for complexity and connections, intensity, being intense, highly motivated, strongly empathetic. Those are all positive characteristics. That's, we would love our kids to have that. But those are characteristics of gifted people that are also merged with the negative, uneasy, uneven mental development, where you have kids that have an, a tremendous vocabulary at age three, but you can't potty train them, right? Do you remember those? Um, that are brilliant in math, but really struggle with language arts, or vice versa. And you're like, but you're so smart, okay? That's my story, by the way. I was highly verbal, um, reading, writing, loved language, loved everything about words, not so much with numbers. And because I was reading really young, and because I was engaging with literature and language, I didn't interact with um, sandbox and playing with, you know, measuring and all that stuff. My son, when he grew up, he said, Mom, is that why we always had a sandbox and you insisted we play? Like, yes, it's trying to help you to be well-rounded. Consequently, when I got into doing math, it, I didn't have the concepts of math. Um, in eighth grade, I walked in and there were no numbers as everything was letters. And I was like, what the heck? Where, <laughs> what's going on here? Algebra meant nothing to me. I never got less than a B in any math course I took because I just memorized the patterns. I just understood the patterns. Did I understand the concepts? No, not at all. Now, years later, telling the story to my very gifted math students, and they would say, oh, but Dr. R, how did you survive? I married a CPA, you know? I just don't, I just don't do numbers. Now, coupled with the fact, and we're going to get to this, look at, look at writ large perfectionism. And I was a perfectionist. So when I hit you know, algebra and didn't really understand it, and I couldn't easily get the A by just kind of following the patterns, I was pretty devastated by that. And uh, didn't, any, didn't want anybody to know that I was struggling. Um, and coupled with the fact that the one time I did ask for some help with math, I was told, but Joni, you're so smart, you'll figure it out. No, I was screaming in my head, I'm dumb as a stump with this, you know, please help. So I just, I, I, I was just a poser all the way through. And I took what was required, the minimum math that was required in high school. I found a college that would take me with a minimum amount of math. I mean, it's just terrible that my, what was negative in me defined my patterns in life until I got old enough to say, ah, forget it, you know? I am a verbal linguistic person and somebody else can do the math and it's okay. But note, note under the negative, that's uneven mental development. If somebody had nurtured me a bit with math, I would have gotten it and I probably would have loved it because, you know, I loved physics when I got to that. I mean, there's, that's really cool science. But, the, but that uneven development, um, and particularly with social skills, you've got these really, really smart kids that are socially so immature, which leads to interpersonal difficulties. Um, underachievement, especially in areas of low interest, it's like, forget it, I'm not doing that. But you need to do that because you're gonna get a grade. No, I don't have to. Grades don't matter, right? Being nonconformist, being perfectionist, um, 
self-critical, uh, their own worst critic, poor self can lead to poor self-image, being very opinionated. Do you have any of those in your household? Um, being different. These extreme feelings of being different start to manifest themselves in about fifth grade. By sixth grade, they're, they're there. And this is one reason I loved my middle schoolers, because they, they so desperately needed that kind of nurturing and somebody to say, yep, you really are quirky weird. And you know what? It's pretty wonderful. And I'm going to introduce you to some other quirky weird people, and you're going to really like them. And they did. And we, we generally could send kids to the high school really pretty well formed and in, in good shape, knowing themselves well. But it takes... We, we, we have to create, as parents and as school districts, we have to create environments that will, will allow those kind of kids to be different and be nurtured. Okay, so what I'm going to do now with you, um, this is a word wall. Now, what has been created here was not created by me, but was created by a 20-year-old who is very tech savvy. And as she was noticing I was putting this together, she said, oh, Joni, this would be so much more interesting if you did blah, 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 a word wall. So what you're going to notice is when it's writ large, it's generalizable. So in cognition, we're going to look at behavioral skills, cognition, social, emotional. But in, with cognition, thinking skills, with gifted people, you can bank on them being original thinkers, having, making unusual connections, being creative, connecting seemingly unrelated ideas. That's pretty much a, a, a given. They may have superior abilities to reason and generalize and problem solve. Sometimes they might have a vivid and rich imagination. Now notice that's smaller, meaning not as generalizable. Sometimes you'll see it. If you don't see it, does that mean you don't have a gifted child? No, not necessarily. Sometimes they have extensive vocabulary and they're fascinated by words. If they are like a little Joni with highly interested in words and being verbal linguistic, may learn new things rapidly. They may have long-term memory. They may grasp mathematical concepts and scientific concepts, but just like being an avid reader or just by, by maybe not as much. Complex thought, abstract, this might not um, manifest itself until they're older because we're looking at our second graders and you're thinking, I don't see a whole lot of abstract thinking. Cognitively, they're really not there yet, okay? But my middle schoolers, not so much my sixth graders, but seventh and eighth graders, sure enough, I would see more and more of this abstract thinking. Mine running on multiple tracks at the same time, very fast, okay? So those are examples of the way um, gifted people think and the, the range of thinking. You can note that there are differences. How about perception and emotion? Writ large, they're highly sensitive. They're sensitive to emotions around them. Sometimes they're sensitive to clothing. Um, I had kids that never wore blue jeans. They don't like the tags on the back of their undershirts. You know, um, Mr. Brodsky's um, work, he did a lot of work on that. Um, sensitive to um, how people perceive them. This is interesting. Gifted people have highly developed senses of humor. One of the, the coolest dissertation topics I saw when I was at Teachers College, and this is going back into the 90s, was a young woman who was in, this is New York City, and she was at a school for gifted preschoolers. Yes, this is New York City. We have gifted preschoolers. And what she did was um, listened to things that that they found humorous. Not things that she found humorous, but things that cracked them up. And she'd write them on post-it notes, like, or index cards. I, in today's world, she'd have her iPad out, right? And she had a whole stack of these, and she was analyzing preschool children's humor, gifted children's humor. I thought that was so cool. Um, often their humor is very off, kind of offbeat and quirky, and 
Certainly their peers often don't get it. Um, in our family, grandmom never got it. Poor Jake. But she adored him because he was the oldest grandchild and he was a son. So he was the prince, as, the, as his sisters would call him. Um, but poor grandmom never really understood Jake's sense of humor. They have a good sense of observation, very perceptive. Um, you'll lose something in the house and they'll tell you exactly where it is. I mean, just attention to detail. Passionate and intense. Um, intensity is the word for gifted. There are many in the field of gifted that talk about that. Sensitive to changes in the environment. Um, tend to be introverted. Um, let's talk about Robin Williams for a minute. Um, wild and crazy, right? Um, we think of these people as being extremely extroverted, but they're, they are on stage, but not so much within themselves. They, they tend to be introverted personalities. Aware of things that are, others are not aware of. They perceive the world very differently. Tolerance for ambiguity and complexity. We wonder about this, you know, we think, well, you know, you're thinking about Steve Jobs and you're thinking about Bill Gates and these people and they seem to be so intense and, you know, so rigid in the way they see the world. But actually, they're so interested in perceptions and gathering information and making connections that they often have a tendency to, to embrace ambiguity seeing many sides of an issue and considering problems from multiple points of view. Having a childlike sense of wonder. And this is writ small, really pretty small. And I think the reason for that is this, this has a lot to do with how we, you as parents, we as educators, nurture them. Openness to experience, again, how are they nurtured? And then I've underlined this one, that they tend to be emotionally stable and serene the caveat being, what do we provide for them? Do we provide a safe, safe space for them? Do we provide an, um, a way for them to be quirky and different and it's okay? And helping them to learn to adjust to the world. Their motivations and values, perfectionism, setting a high standard for themselves and for others. They often get in trouble in class because they correct the teacher, or they correct other students, or they're very um, linear about rule following. Well, you know, but that's the rule. That's what we're supposed to do. You might see this if you have um, a gifted child in your household and you have siblings that they get really bent out of shape if there are, we deviate from the norm but that perfectionism, doing it, there's a right way of doing things. Very curious and um, a desire to know, very independent and autonomous. This is the one that drives teachers and often parents crazy. Because how do teachers often motivate kids? There's gonna be a test on this. You better study, you better pay attention, you're gonna fail the test. <gasps> You know, and there's part of our brain that goes, okay, pay attention, because dad's gonna kill us if we don't do well on this math test. But a gifted brain is like, I don't really care. Doesn't matter to me. Doesn't have any meaning for me. So, th so that reward and praise thing is, is tough. Seeker of ultimate truths and looking for patterns and meaning in life, that, that need for purposefulness, that need for meaning. Why are we doing this? And I got to the point where I could say to my students, we're doing this because the state of New Jersey requires us to do it. Like the park test, for example, you know? And we're doing this because we have to do this in order to, get, to, to move on to the next level. I had one kid that said, when is it ever going to get good? Meaning school. I said, honey, maybe graduate school. Because you go through high school and you still have the requirements that you have to do. I don't want to take Spanish. You have to have a foreign language. I don't really want to do math. Well, you have to have three levels of math to get to college. And then you get to college and you have to do your, your gen eds, those general education courses. You know? And sometimes college doesn't really get good until about junior year, where it's something called your major and you can really drill down into what you love. And then you go to grad school or you go into your career 
and you never again do those things that you don't enjoy doing, right? And I mean, we have to remind ourselves of this because, you know, people in the real world, if, if you're in business, for example, and you're the engineer, do you know anything about the accounting, right? Many years ago, GM brought all the different parts of the people that made the car together. And the engineers explained to the designers why the, the screw that was, that was used to affix the glove compartment was really misplaced, that it took so long, it was so tedious, can't you affix it here? And then the accountant said, and that would save us money. That idea of being interdisciplinary. We are in real life interdisciplinary. We have conversations with people that are not in the field that we're in. However, we don't do their job. We have that conversation and then we trust that the engineer is going to do the engineering, the accounting is going to do the accounting, and the marketing people are going to do all that stuff with the outside world and you know, sell stuff. We work to our own strengths. It's only in school where we require kids to be good in everything all the time. That we, that we make a big deal about getting straight A's. And in order to do that, we have brought down the standard of what an A really is. An A should be exceptional, unusual. I never gave an A plus. I thought it was redundant. And I never gave a D minus. Kiddo, it's an F. <laughs> you know, call it for what it is. High standards. The, these people enjoy challenge and risk taking. Um, I do a whole thing on um, the teenage brain. If you're ever interested, when you get a little, when your kids get a little older, you want to bring me back for the middle school people. But I do a whole thing on the teenage brain. Um, and part of the teenage brain is, is highly controlled by um, chemicals and endorphins that um, are running crazy. Um, this, the need for taking a risk, meeting a challenge, releases happy drugs, like happy hormones, happy chemicals in our brains. If we don't provide safe ways for kids to take risks, like academic risks, like creative risks, when they get older, they look for stuff like shoplifting, you know, or, or breaking rules. To get, that, to get that rush. Anyway, you don't need to think about that yet. Anybody have middle school kids? Um, I'm talking to one person. You understand. Outrage at injustice or moral breaches. A real high sense of justice. Okay, this is quirky, but has anybody seen the movie The Accountant? Yeah, I, I hope children, you haven't seen it. It is very violent. Now, John Ruderman's a CPA. He's an accountant, and he likes action adventure. He thought it'd be the perfect movie. Well, Ben Affleck in this movie plays a very high-functioning autistic man. It's a, it's a really, really good story. Um, and my husband was fascinated by this. And this guy is a cold-blooded killer because, you know, that whole autism thing, there's, a, there's like an emotional flatness, you know, not feeling. And yet, when you really drill down in the story, he's going after bad guys. He has this incredibly highly defined sense of moral justice. And he has no compunction about putting a bullet in somebody's head if they did something he felt was not morally just. I don't know. I just was thinking about that because I saw it the other night and went, oh yeah, there you go. Wide range of in interests and overwhelmed by interests and abilities. We all know about ADD and ADHD, but gifted kids, this is fascinating, gifted kids often manifest similar behaviors to ADHD and ADD, and they're often misprescribed, misidentified and misprescribed because what, it's not really ADHD, which is, is truly a, um, a disability and a um, a quirk in some human brains, but gifted brains are running on multiple tracks all the time. 
And it sometimes manifests itself in behavior that they're not paying attention or they're not, you know, following directions or they're not being good, good students, good school students. That strong moral convictions, integrity, honesty, having a high drive. Again, writ small because it depends on if it's important to them. Loving ideas and, and excited about discussion. Being sincere, writ very small, again, but can be there. And again, underlined acceptance of self and others. If we do our job well, if you parents and school are working together, when these kids are in a good, a good place where people understand them, they really are empathetic creatures. They really are um, happy with themselves. Activity levels, huge, high energy. Hard time sleeping, didn't nap well as a baby, difficult to get them to sleep, you know, eight hours, forget it. If you can get them to sleep six, seven hours, that would be a great night. High, high energy. Um, forget road trips until they're old enough to read in the car by themselves. Um, <laughs> couple that with having a long attention span and sustained concentration. Now, when I've done this for teachers, they're like, oh, Joan, no way. Okay, let's think this through. Because parents, you see this, this long attention span, this concentration. If your kid is really interested in something, they're building a Lego tower. They've got something that they just got for the holiday gift, and they're still experimenting with it. Um, they're playing with writing. They're an artist. And it's Saturday morning, and they've been in their room for a couple hours, and you call them for lunch. I'll be there. I'll be there shortly. I'll be there. And you call them 30 minutes later, and you call them an hour later. They just are so intensely focused. Teachers don't see this in school. How can we see it in school when every 40 minutes there's a bell or there's a schedule or we're moving or we're changing? You know, the, the lesson in history is just getting really good and history class is over. Even worse, the unit's over. Wow, it's just getting good. Oh, sorry, we're on to you know, the Rus Russian Revolution now. Uh. This is why kids often turn on, we talk about the late bloomer in college. Because again, think about it, by the time there may be a sophomore, certainly by junior year, they're drilling down into their major interest and they can fully concentrate on it, right? I don't know the answer to this. School is what school is, and we just try to make it the best we can. And I certainly, with my own students, help them to negotiate how to do school well. That was always the first requirement. With my own kids growing up, how to do school well, that's their job. But I think that within their school week, for some of these quirky kids, there's a place that we can build into their school time that's a little bit more flexibility, more choice, um, something that they can explore their passions. It gets better at the high school. As Cindy pointed out, high schools have a wealth of opportunities after school. And parents, this is where you come in because you provide all that wealth of wonderful opportunities after school, right? Your kids get into music, they get into ice skating, they get into dance, they get into whatever, 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 because they're passionate about it and they can really engage. Again, with this long attention span, working themselves to exertion, to exhaustion and as they exert themselves. Needing periods of contemplation and solitude, this is another tough one for kids in school and this is what you as parents can provide at home. Your kids come home and they are physically and emotionally exhausted. They have played the game all day. They have played nicely at lunch and at recess. They have engaged in the classroom. They have answered the teacher's questions. And what they really, really want to do is finish their book or play with their Sudoku or do their art. And they come home and you can get a grunt out of them. And this is even before middle school. Even, even our little ones will come in, and what they want to do is just time to themselves. And you'll find them playing happily in their space with what is interesting to them. But that's what's going on with that. And that's something that home can provide that it's very hard for school to provide. 
And they can be spontaneous. They can be wonderfully spontaneous, again, if we give them room for that. Okay, so social relations. Most people understand that quirky people, um, it's like the Big Bang Theory. Who, who watches the Big Bang Theory? Okay, they're my peeps, man. That's, that, those, I have taught all of them. Um, from um, Leonard, who is just so sweet, to Howard, who doesn't have the PhD, but he can build and make anything, to Raj, who is just so sweet and sincere and brilliant, to Sheldon, who is miserable. <laughs> and we've watched, uh, one of the things that I love about the show is over the years that it's been on, we've watched them all emerge and grow in their characters. And we're watching um, now Sheldon engage in a relationship and helping to, he's starting to understand how to read other people's um, emotions. So the social relations, we understand with really bright people, this is kind of can be hard. This is tough. Again, writ large, meaning it is often found in gifted people that they question authority and rules make school a really tough place. Why are we doing this? And sometimes I had to say, because the state of New Jersey makes us do it. Because I'm the teacher, that's why. I hate to say that to you, but it's just the nature of life. Sometimes you, you use that line with your kids. Why are we doing this? Because I'm the mom. End of story, right? They ask embarrassing questions, like why? <laughs> Um, my daughter-in-law, Kate, who's a, a physician down in North Carolina, a brilliant woman, just a charmer. I, I adore Kate. And she tells a story that she got, she got thrown out of CCD. Now, this is religious school for Catholic kids. When she was six years old for asking why and questioning transubstantiation. Now, in the Catholic Church, this is when the body and blood of Christ is blessed and this becomes transubstantiated into God. And she's like, nope, that's not happening. <laughs> and they're like, you know, blasphemy, called in her parents and said, Kate is not, not allowed to come back to CCD. And Kate was a resting Catholic until she met Jake and, you know, and now she is comfortable with the Catholic Church. It's okay. You know, she's got all this scientific knowledge, but it's okay. You know, there's a faith thing over there as well. I love that story. I mean, how many of our really, really bright kids ask questions like, where do the tides come from? Why, I have a little grandson that is fascinated by the moon, and the moon gets bigger and the moon gets smaller, and he's just fascinated by the moon. You know, and the moon goes away, you know? And he's 20 months old, you know? But what they, what they pick up on and what they're, what they're curious about and the questions they ask can be challenging for you as parents and for us at school. Very often feeling different and out of step, um, feeling alienated and alone. I think that's the beauty of the Big Bang Theory because you have these four quirky guys that found each other. And not only did they find each other, but they actually found women in their lives that could love and accept them and, and, and live with them. They can be very compassionate. You don't think of, let's talk about Sheldon on the Big Bang Theory. We don't think about Sheldon being compassionate. He's very self-centered and narcissistic. But he does care what his friends think. He doesn't want them to be unhappy. And sometimes he makes himself uncomfortable to make sure that they're going to be OK, which goes along with being empathetic. Being able to feel what others feel, helping, helping to understand yourself through how others are engaging with the world. We don't think of really bright people being able to do that, but, but they can. And again, might be learned. OK. We just went through some really interesting research and a compilation of what makes gifted kids, what kind of characteristics that we can look for. And there were some that were really big, like perfectionism and like the need to be creative and come up with their own ideas. Now let's look at what screens kids out of gifted programs. And this comes from Roger Taylor, he's a brilliant man. Bored with routine tasks, refusing to do rote homework. Difficult to get him or her to move on to another topic, but it's just getting good. I don't want to put my book away. 
Self-critical and impatient with failures. That's the perfectionism thing. Critical of others, of the teacher. Often disagrees vocally with others, including the teacher. Making jokes or puns, remember that sense of humor thing, at inappropriate times. Emotionally sensitive, they might overreact, get angry, get frustrated, cry if things go wrong. Not interested in details, hands in messy work. I had a student um, several years ago, he now is a, a college graduate, and again, doing wonderfully in his career. And Peter was brought to me when he was in sixth grade by his um, case manager, child study team case manager. He was a classified student. And she said, you know what, Peter, you need to meet Dr. Ruddeman, and Dr. Ruddeman, you need to meet Peter. So I worked with him a bit in sixth grade. As he got into seventh grade, um, his social studies teacher came to me, and she said, Joan, I don't know what's going on with Peter, but there are things that he just is brilliant with, and then other stuff he doesn't have a clue. He was fascinated with the Civil War, the American, uh, the American Civil War. And when they got to that chapter, there wasn't anything this kid didn't know. But then they got to you know, the Industrial Revolution and was like, you know, not so much. She said, but I have a really hard time understanding what he knows for his tests because his handwriting is so terrible. I said, did you ever ask him to type it? Oh, well, we can't do that because then everybody would have to type their work. Why would everybody have to type their work if their handwriting is okay? But if you have somebody that has poor handwriting, shouldn't they be using a typewriter? That's to me like saying, you wear glasses, that's not fair to the other students take your glasses off. It's called differentiation. It's a good term in education, you know? Different things for different needs, you know? Peter needed to type stuff. Ultimately, they took him out of social studies and he did a social studies program with me and we had a blast with the seventh grade social studies program. He would go through the, the unit, not the chapter, but the unit in like a day. We would take the unit test, satisfy everybody that he knew that unit, and then he would dig deeply into some really, really interesting um, nonfiction history. And then he would write amazing papers. And the first one he turned into me, I thought, oh man, I wonder if there's a mom or dad you know, that's working on this. And then I met his mom and dad, and they just had no clue that he was doing this stuff. This is the idea that handing in messy work, not doing homework, not behaving well in class. And I had teachers that actually would say to me, Joan, he doesn't deserve to go to the prism room, this gifted thing that we did, because he doesn't, and there's the list. I said, well, that's exactly why he does need the prism room. Tends to dominate others, except, doesn't accept authority, nonconforming. So all the things, interestingly enough, all the things in the, the word wall that we just saw on cognition and values and emotion and activity that we understand about the gifted psyche, the gifted behaviors, are the very things that in many gifted programs screen kids out of getting the support that they need. I think it's really important, this is shifting gears a little bit, but there's something called the competencies for 21st century skills. And you can Google this, it's P21. If you look for P21, it's the Partnership for 21st Century Skills. This has been around for probably about five years. And it came out of the real world. It didn't come from the Department of Education. It didn't, you know, it came from people like you in the real world of business that said, we're not real happy with people that we're hiring out of college. They are well behaved, well dressed, well spoken. They get along with their peers, but they take no initiative. They wait to be told what to do. They wait to be told how to do it. They get it done really nicely, and then they come back and they wait for praise. And the real world of business said to our world of education, what are you doing? Well, they were right, that's what we were doing. We tell kids what to do, we tell them how to do it, we tell when it's gonna be due, and then we ask them to move into the next thing, and they have to do it always with a good attitude, 
always with collaboration, you know, being nice, and they get out in the real world and they're, they're really not suited to functioning in their careers. So these are the competencies. Being a self-directed learner, taking initiative, being in, an informationally literate person. Can you read and look something up on the internet and ascertain if it's true or not? We're in the world of fake news, right? And this is, like, this is what we're all hearing about. How many of us read across the political spectrum? How many of us go to um, a fact check to see, really, Did, like, is that really what was said? Is that the whole quote, you know? Do we, do we get information and understand that it's from a, um, a, a substantial or a source that can, that can be verified, okay? Life skill, something that we all should do. Are we effective communicators? Are we collaborative team members? Can we work well with others? And you people in the real world, in your work, you have to collaborate with others. Do we ask kids to be creative and practical problem solvers? And all of this is so that they can be globally aware and active citizens, good citizens. These are the competencies of 21st century skills, and that should be the groundwork for all education, and in many places it is. So in the REACH program in Hillsborough, this is what they've been working towards for the last probably five years, to develop complex and abstract and higher level cognitive processes, giving kids a place to problem solve, be self-directed, do some true research, make some decisions for themselves, to develop awareness and acceptance of oneself as unique. Having a place where kids can have opportunities to talk to others and their teachers or mentors about, I'm kind of different, like, I, like people don't really get my jokes, okay? And help them to understand that that's okay, you know, and we're going to hook you up with people that, that will get your jokes. To increase independence and individuality and self-direction in learning. So the REACH program, if you've been following this through, is working towards providing opportunities to service and to support these unique needs. It, uh, the REACH program meets the special needs and interests and abilities of identified students. Here you are, providing instruction that differs in process and rate and depth. Some kids, you saw Bart and Lisa, some kids get it the first time, some kids get it you know, six times. What happens to the kid who gets it the first time and has to sit there and, and have it repeated and retaught the next day and the next day? And they're the ones that have the, the book in their desk that they're reading or they're doing their math puzzles or they're acting out in class, you know? Is there some way that we can meet their needs in a different way? Emphasizing intellectual integrity and risk-taking and curiosity and feeding that intrinsic motivation. Extending their ability to do higher level cognitive processes, to synthesize and, uh, and work with complex and abstract ideas. Some kids aren't ready for that. They will be by the time they get to seventh, eighth grade, high school. Some kids in like third and fourth grade are already cognitively at that point and need something that is more stimulating abstractly than what they would be doing. Helping them to find constructive peer relationships. Developing their independence by encouraging them to initiate and create. And providing opportunities for in-depth learning in their area of interest. It's called independent study. Well, you probably had that when you were in school, you know, or doing a seminar class or something. But Mrs. Sassini has figured out a way, and Hillsborough has figured out a way to build this into the curriculum. Is it for every child? No, it's not. Doesn't need to be. So if you hear that your neighbor's daughter is doing something, and you're like, my daughter's not doing that, talk to your daughter and say, hey, Sarah next door is da da da. Yeah, she goes to this thing. I don't want to do that. Listen to your child. They will tell you what their needs are. Or your child will come home and say, Sarah's doing the coolest thing, I really wanna do it. Well, 
Have a conversation with the teachers. Have a conversation with Mrs. Cassini. Find out what's available when kids have that motivation and drive. OK. Let me keep going. So the COGAT is your first measure in this district of where your kids are with intellectual ability. And what you need to understand is there is no way to prepare for this. Parents, it is what it is, OK? What you need to do is make sure they have good night's rest. You need to make sure that they have some food in them. You need to make sure that they're comfortable and happy, that they're not feeling overwhelmed, like, oh my god, this test is going to define who I am for the rest of my life, because it's not, OK? It's just a measure, a, a, a snapshot of where your child is at this point in time in relationship to their peers in Hillsborough and um, nationally. It is a test of cognitive ability. It's not what they know as far as, um, like the park test, tests what kids do with English and math and science, right? How much, um, it's not abilities, it's, it's, it's um, content, what they know. The COGAT test is strictly their cognitive abilities. It, it, that's all it is. It is a baseline. It is not the end all and be all. But it, is it important? Yes, it's important. Because it just gives us a, a, a baseline understanding of where your child is. And it, it helps to identify kids that, that may have, remember the idea of the uneven development? I've got a great story for you. Several years ago, our wonderful fifth grade GT person would go into every fifth, fourth, and fifth grade class. And she did something on the, on the um, competencies. And she did a little bit on multiple intelligence theory. And she walked into a fifth grade class one day. And so every fifth grade kid was hearing this. And the kid was sitting in the back of the room. And he was fiddling with something at his desk and totally turned off. And Shannon got started. And she was doing her thing. And, and the kid sat up and started listening. And, you know, put his stuff down and leaned his elbows on the desk and was really intent. When she was finished, he follows her out in the hall and he says, I need that PowerPoint on different ways of being smart because my father needs to see this. He thinks I'm stupid and I'm not. It's fifth grade. So Shannon neat person that she is, comes back and pulls out his COGAT test. Now, this is a different district, but same test. Pulls out his COGAT scores when he was in second grade. Let me tell you, verbal ability, like 60 percentile, 50 percentile, not great. Spatial ability, the ability to like do analytical thinking, sequencing, like that, 99 plus, meaning off the charts. My father thinks I'm stupid, but I'm not. This kid was not good in school. He didn't do reading and writing well. He was OK in math. He certainly had way poor self-esteem, right? But he had a wonderful ability to problem solve and figure stuff out and do models. And he was like, wait a minute. That's another way of being smart. I'm that kind of smart. And sadly, there's not a whole lot of places that you can exhibit that kind of smart when you're in public school. Where does it come out? It comes out in hobbies. It comes out when you're an adult and you start building things and creating things and you're an engineer, right? My concern is making sure that kids are well served, happy with themselves, get the support, the appropriate, the appropriate support they need so that they can be happy, well-adjusted, self-accepting, so they can find themselves as they move into middle school, high school, and their career, right? Doesn't do any good for us to label kids. I am not into labeling. The closest I come to it is saying, hey, you're, you're kind of spatial with that. Hey, you're, you know, kind of got some linguistic stuff going on, you know? Hey, you're kind of left brain or right brain. 
but for kids to help to understand how they're wired so that we can best support them and they can support themselves. Yes, Dr. Rudiman is, is staying around to answer some questions. I'm just gonna go through some logistics of the identification process. Like Dr. Rudiman said, the COGAT test is coming up for second grade. Um, and for any students in older grades that are nominated, like Dr. Rudiman also said, this is a baseline. Um, one of the ways that we can make the program as accessible to as many students as possible is by doing what's called a universal screening. So while your students take a lot of assessments, this is designed to really understand things that we might not see in the classroom because it's not around the New Jersey state standards and what we need to teach every day. It's trying to understand how your child thinks. So again, no way to prepare other than just your normal routine. We do ask that you don't put any stress on your child around this test because stress inhibits cognitive function and we wanna see what their cognitive function is. So we try to tell kids that this test is just important to do your best on because it helps us understand how you think. So as much as we can make it a, a normal school day, but you know, encourage kids taking it with appropriate seriousness, that's the balance that we're looking for. So it is gonna start next week, depending on the weather we have. Um, we've had really good weather so far this year, so hopefully we can get the test done Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And um, you will receive an email from me with the results. It will contain the verbal, quantitative, and nonverbal results, both nationally and locally. If you have questions about the results, we'll be sure to make sure that you get those answered. There is additional information that you can seek on the Riverside Publishing website that will just offer their spin on what the results mean. But again, it's, it's one measure of your child and when you receive the results from me, it will come with the caveat of there is a teacher in the district who sees your child every day for many hours and that teacher is the best source of information about your child because they have given your child multiple assessments in every subject and can really give you an idea of where your child is with their individual strengths and weaknesses and how they compare to their peers. So again, we've been through the initial screening, the universal screening to all second graders. If your child does extraordinarily well on that assessment, I will ask you when I send you the results to give, me, to give the district permission to do further screening on your child. Again, we don't want one test to be a be all end all of whether a child participates in the program. So we do look across the different subtests of the COGAT and rather than give children you know, a whole nother cognitive assessment that would be redundant, the cognitive assessment is just a starting point. And then we also collect achievement data and creativity. So again, really no way for students to study for those just try their best and be confident that the district is giving these assessments because we want to find good matches between your child's needs, any child's needs, and the program. We want kids to be in the program who will be successful in it um, and benefit and be having needs met that wouldn't be met in the classroom with a, a, a reasonable amount of attention from the teacher. So I will ask for both informal teacher feedback and feedback from you as parents. This is not something that we count up and say, well, if you say all of these great things about your child, your child will be in the program. It's more for your reflective purposes and for me to understand if we communicate what some of your observations are about your child. So um, you know, if your child does qualify for further screening, please don't stress about filling that out. It's just meant to be a reflective tool. It's led to some really interesting conversations with me and, and parents in the district, for example, one family I met with last year um, answered a question about gender expression and how Dr. Runman talked about kids being not, not conformist. Sometimes that can take the form of gender expression. You know, a, a mother who couldn't understand why her daughter really wanted to have short hair and was really frustrated by that. So, you know, that could be something that, that is related to giftedness. There is some literature about that. So, Again, that's part of the identification process. So like I've stressed all night, our goal is to look at a student's needs, 
In a lot of states, gifted and talented programming falls under the umbrella of special education. That is not the way that New Jersey has structured gifted education. But in essence, you can think about it like a program for a child with exceptional needs. So I think that's helpful for some parents in understanding why we have the program and why we have multiple criteria to see if this is really a good fit for a particular child. These are the lists of specialists at the different schools. Two of them have been kind enough to volunteer their time tonight. If you could raise your hands over there, Mrs. Mandresha and Mrs. Dallenbach, thank you so much for coming this evening. So you can contact the gifted specialists at any of the schools if you have particular questions like about the scheduling of the tests. So as you can imagine with six elementary schools, I can't personally schedule when the best time to pull out Ms. Copen's second grade class would be. So that all happens at the building level. My contact information I will leave up here, and this is the point of the evening where I thank you very deeply for your time and care to come out here tonight.